The big camera companies do not want you to know this. Most wildlife filmmakers do not need to buy the newest cameras. Today I'm going to talk through why this is and also explain what you can do to make better wildlife films without buying new kit. The wildlife filmmaking industry, probably more than any other, is based on innovation and new ways of filming things. Among the big things that we see on this, our screens all the time, elephants and lions and cheetahs, there's very little that is new in terms of behaviour and so we need to find new ways of filming it. But in spite of that, I don't think that you or me should upgrade our cameras. The camera companies make money by selling cameras. <laughs> I know it sounds simple, but it's their job to make the newest cameras the most desirable. And so they put shiny new cameras out, they put them in the hands of creators and influencers, and you see them online and you want to buy them. And I am absolutely not immune from this. So many things that come out. I would love to get my hands on all of them, but in reality, I don't think it would make the films that I make any better. It's just that marketing pressure to, to buy things. These are all things that the camera companies are putting in incrementally in their cameras to make them more appealing. And most of them, especially as wildlife filmmakers, we don't need. The first thing is resolution. There's this resolution race that's been going on, more and more and more megapixels, more Ks. Realistically, does anyone watch anything in higher definition than 4K? Here in the UK, the BBC broadcasts at HD online and on iPlayer. And even their HD is, is throttled a bit. We're not seeing on TV the full resolution that I've been filming at for the last 12 years. My most recent project was actually delivered in HD. Even though we shot in 4K, it was a, an HD delivery. So ridiculous amounts of resolution that we're working with now is unnecessary. Anything above 12 megapixels is probably wasted. There is the argument that higher resolutions are better for archive. It's better to have really good behavior at a lower resolution than all right behavior at 8K. Because there are now tools that you can use to up-res that footage and they look really good. You don't need a lot of resolution. Autofocus. We do not need autofocus in cameras. It can be the fastest autofocus in the world. But when you put a CN20 on the front of your camera, it's a manual focus lens. So that doesn't really matter. And often long lenses, certainly at ground level, we're filming through grass, we're filming through this stuff. The autofocus will spoil the shot. So manual focus is where we're still operating. Even the fastest autofocus in the world won't make a difference if you've got a CN20 or some really nice cinema primes on the front of your camera. The next thing that camera companies have been incrementally adding to their cameras, and as wildlife filmmakers, is totally unnecessary for us, is in-body image stabilization. We have really long lenses, and so you do notice vibration and wobble. If you have a solid tripod and a big solid tripod head and good technique, you shouldn't need in-body image stabilization. Oh, buzzed somewhere. Another thing that is a big selling point for the camera companies that really isn't necessary for us as wildlife filmmakers is a full frame sensor. And most of the time we're using long lenses and certainly for professional shoots where we're using the CN20, that only covers Super 35. So having a full frame sensor is a bit of a waste really because you just don't use it. You get vignetting around the edges. Another benefit of having a cropped sensor, either a Super 35 or a Micro Four Thirds sensor, is you get extra range on your lenses. And that's something that is a, actually a negative of having a full frame sensor. You don't have as much reach on your 
on your lenses. A 600 millimeter lens, my, for instance, my 60 to 600 millimeter lens on a Super 35 camera becomes a um, 900 and it's a 1200 on, a, on micro four thirds. So as wildlife filmmakers, we're often trying to get closer to the animals. We want more reach on our lenses. And so having a cropped sensor really helps with that. The only time I'd say that's different is when you need to film at night and you need extra light and often a larger sensor like I have in the FX6 helps with low light filming. But most of the time we're filming during the day, a Super 35 or a Micro Four Thirds sensor is probably a really good idea. Another thing that keeps on creeping up in all the cameras, and it is useful, but I would say it's overrated as well, is dynamic range. Now, don't get me wrong, having a camera that can shoot a huge dynamic range is great, but dawn and dusk is when animals are most active, generally. It's also when there's least contrast. Shooting when there is most contrast, when you need the highest dynamic range in the middle of the day, often doesn't look great. With a bit of creativity, even with a, a camera with small dynamic range, you're able to work around it. And one example of this is my student film that I made a long time ago on a ca Canon 7D. I don't know what the dynamic ranges for that camera, but in comparison to cameras nowadays, it's minuscule. And I was filming the Barbary macaques in Morocco in the forest, so you get deep shadows and bright sunlight, and so huge dynamic range. And what having that small dynamic range on the camera forced me to do was film early in the morning and late in the evenings, and it meant that the whole film was filmed at golden hour, essentially, and it looked great. Dynamic range is nice to have, but it's certainly not something that is absolutely necessary. There are quite a few other things as well. DJI are a massive culprit for this and they have incremental upgrades and it's not revolutionary new technology. It's just slight upgrades, but how they're sold makes you feel like you want a new camera, a new drone, so they have slightly better battery life, slightly better resolution, slightly better frame rate, slightly better codecs. And so when you're comparing two cameras, yes, the new one is better, the new drone is better, but if you already have one, it's probably not worth getting the new one, unless you have a project in mind for it where it is definitely going to be useful. And one example of this would be the Inspire 3 and its RTK kit. In Green Planet, we flew a lot of time studies. They just weren't accurate enough and the RTK kit would solve that. There are circumstances where the new upgraded technology can be useful, but for 99% of the time, you don't need to buy a new camera. Another thing is, certainly working professionally, it doesn't make any sense to buy the newest cameras because the production companies, if there is a specific camera format that is required, whether it's a slow motion Phantom or whether it's a Raptor, they will generally supply that camera for you. Those cameras are owned by the production companies and so it wouldn't make any sense for me to buy the latest, greatest, biggest, highest spec camera. And so for my personal needs, I don't need to buy a Raptor because if I'm on a shoot that requires one, it will be provided by production. So that, that is another little thing to think about in terms of working professionally within the industry, that, that buying the most expensive gear, the highest end gear, isn't necessary. It's a bit different if you're an on-location cinematographer and people come to you to provide footage or uh, stock images, then Having your own kit that's high-end is, is good, but I'd argue 4K is probably enough. It's the behavior that counts rather than the, rather than the resolution. I told you what not to do, which is don't buy a new camera, but what should you do? I definitely recommend buying secondhand. And I buy lots of my kit secondhand. The FX6 that I'm filming this now, I got secondhand, secondhand tripod, secondhand head. My F-stop backpack, GH5, picked that up secondhand and you save a lot of money because immediately 
when you buy something new, it's a bit like buying a new car. You get that huge depreciation cliff. Immediately on buying it, you lose some money. And it's nice to have the newest things, especially if it's useful and if you're going to need one of the features that is new. But most of the time we don't. We just like having shiny things. Obviously there's places like eBay and Facebook Marketplace where you can buy directly from sellers. For a bit more security, you can go through places like MPB or Wex who will buy kit secondhand and then resell it on and they will check it first. And so you have the warranty or assurance of a company that you're buying kit from rather than from a, an individual seller. There are no secrets to filming wildlife. Most of it is time spent with the animal. And the more time you spend with an animal, the better you get to know it, the better you get to know the behavior, and the, the more time you have to film that behavior in new and interesting ways. And so save money on cameras by buying second hand and use that money to go to interesting places where cool animals are and use the kit that you bought second hand to film them. That is gonna improve your wildlife filmmaking so much more than any new camera could. Before you all grab your second hand cameras and run off out into the wilderness, I want to give a massive shout out to both Luke Forsyth and Rick Bebbington, who I took in inspiration from for this video. I'll put the links down below, go and check them out. Say that I sent you, if you think I'm wrong, and you do think that new cameras and new technology are, are really important in wildlife filmmaking, then let me know. Or if you've also got a really good second-hand deal, then let me know about that. I'd love to hear it. And until next time, go outside, film some cool wildlife, and spend time out in the wild like this. And see you next time.